<clears throat> Welcome back to Water Quality in the Pacific Northwest. Today we're going to talk about using benthic macroinvertebrates to assess water quality uh, in some watersheds here in the Pacific Northwest. Again, uh, we're in our series of lectures on pollutants and measurements, specifically about surface water quality. In this series of lectures, uh, we've talked about nutrients, sediments, erosion on land. We've spent two lectures on eutrophication. We talked about temperature. And now we're spending two units on macroinvertebrates. In the last lecture, I introduced the topic of macroinvertebrates, what they're good for, what they're indicators of. And today, I want to sh today I'd like to show you some actual research with macroinvertebrates to show you how macroinvertebrate numbers actually relate to some real-world measurements. Hence, uh, today's lecture is our second on macroinvertebrates. Again, I'm going to talk about a study uh, looking at macroinvertebrates and whether they are actually very good in assessing water quality. And as our test cases, we're using 15 different watersheds here in the Pacific Northwest, specifically here in Idaho. Um, uh, there is a paper that is published off of this work. Uh, here's a reference uh, called Using Benthic Macroinvertebrates to Assess Water Quality in 15 Watersheds in the Pacific Northwest. This article appeared uh, in 2017 in the International Journal of Sustainable Development and Planning. Uh, the reference is volume 12, pages uh, 51 to 60. So to quickly review um, the value of using beth, uh, benthic macroinvertebrates as a biological assessment of water quality, uh, we're just going to go back over some of the high points of the last lecture. Biological assessment is a common technique used to determine the biological integrity and the water quality of flowing water bodies. So again, we're talking about flowing water bodies. Biological assess assessments have two distinct advantages over a chemical evaluation. First of all, a biological evaluation is less expensive most of the time, and it can detect problems and synergistic effects of pollutants on the environment. And it can be looked at a specific site in the environment. Uh, the benthic macroinvertebrate index indicates a local. Uh, the biological, the benthic mass, uh, benthic macroinvertebrate index possess a wide range of trophic levels and pollution tolerances that allow for comparison. We're looking at all sorts of macroinvertebrates in a stream, and different macroinvertebrates have different tolerance levels to different things like sediments or nitrates or phosphates. And because we have so many different macroinvertebrates that have different tolerances, we can develop an index that will give us a good indicator of perturbation. So they can tell us how mixed up or how disturbed the environment is compared to what would be a normal, pristine environment. And the benthic macroinvertebrates, remember, are a primary food source for fish, uh, so they're important. Again, it's easy and economical to develop a BMI or to actually come up with a BMI index. And that's because benthic macroinvertebrates are abundant and they're diverse in most streams. So what we're after is we're after what we call an SMI score, a macroinvertebrate based score, index score. And um, in this study, we're going to take a look at 15 different watersheds in Idaho and we want to relate our macroinvertebrate number 
or index uh, to visually looking at soil erosion, to visually look at water quality, and to look at adjacent land use, land use adjacent to the stream. If we can relate uh, the Menthic Macro Invertebrate Index score to erosion rates, to visual estimates, and to adjacent land use, uh, we can truly um, get good values. Because if you look at observed soil erosion rates, visual estimates of water quality, and adjacent land use, those are all subjective things. But a benthic macroinvertebrate index score that is developed via science and sampling in the field uh, is not subjective. It's pretty objective. So let's take a look at uh, what we did in, uh, north, in Idaho. Again, here's a picture of the Pacific Northwest part of the country. Here's our state of Idaho. And we had 15 stream sites in Idaho. Most of them are in the north that we were trying to relate benthic macroinvertebrate scores to visual things like soil erosion rates, land use, and things like that. Some of the watersheds were rangeland. Uh, this is in the Oahe Mountains and uh, Boulder Creek in southwestern Idaho. Many of the watersheds were in forests or on cropland. Uh, such as this watershed here in the northern part of the state. Another watershed. So in this study, we use benthic macroinvertebrates to measure water quality. Uh, we use 15 watersheds, and within those 15 watersheds, we had 124 sampling sites. The watersheds that we used ranged in size from maybe only a thousand hectares to almost 175,000 hectares. And this study basically uh, was data that was, uh, consists of data that was collected over a 14 year period. So let's take a look at these uh, watersheds for just a few moments. First of all, you'll see a table that we'll go through. Uh, the watershed is on the left, the name of the watershed, the area of the size of the watershed, land use in the center, the year that the samples were taken, and how many sampling sites were actually in each watershed. So we take a look at Big Boulder. Uh, this happens to be in the Oahe Mountains in southwestern Idaho. The watershed itself was 82,000 hectares, and the land use in this watershed was 95% range, 5% cropland. We sampled this back in 2003. A graduate student used Big Boulder Creek as their thesis site, and they had seven sampling sites within Big Boulder Creek. Next one is Big Canyon. Big Canyon is in Lewis County, 36,600 hectares in area, and this canyon watershed was 50% cropland and 50% range. This uh, watershed was sampled in 2009, and there were nine distinct sampling sites within this watershed. We had the Clear Creek watershed. Again, in northern Idaho, 37,000 hectares in size, primarily a forest watershed, 70% forest, 25% range, and 5% miscellaneous. It was sampled in 2008, and there were 10 sampling sites. And then we had the Cow Creek Watershed, which is in Lataw County, 10,268 hectares in size. Uh, this was 90% cropland, 10% rangeland. It was sampled in 2010, and there were seven sampling sites. Again, there's 15 watersheds that were used as part of this study. So let's look to the Crew Marine, a watershed very small, only 1,100 hectares, and it was primarily a crop watershed. 80% of the land was cropland, 20% rangeland, 
The year was sampled was 2009, and there were six sampling sites within this watershed. Fish Creek. Fish Creek is on the Locksaw River, um, 75,740 hectares. It's a forest watershed. It's 80% forest, 20% rangeland. No cropland in here. Uh, most of it's basically a national forest. It was sampled in 2011, and there were eight sampling sites within this watershed. Jim Ford Creek, um, Clearwater County, 23,800 hectares in size, 70% forest land, 15% rangeland. Um, it was sampled in 2001, and there were actually 18 different sampling sites in this watershed. And then we had Lake Creek, um, 9,300 hectares. Uh, this is up off of uh, Lake Coeur d'Alene in Kootenai and bon uh, Benoit County. It is 40% cropland and 60% forest land. It was sampled in 2003, and uh, there were six sampling sites. Other watersheds, the Lapway Creek Watershed, Nesperce County, about 174,000 hectares in size. This watershed was about 50% rangeland, 50% cropland. It was sampled in 2010, and there were eight sampling sites within this watershed. Myrtle Creek, we go all the way up to the northernmost county in the state. We go to Boundary County. This creek, uh, this watershed consisted of 10,900 acres and it was 95% forest land. Uh, the mouth of uh, Myrtle Creek was cropland, 5% cropland. It was sampled in 2004 and had nine sampling sites. We had Orofino watershed, uh, almost 50,000 hectares, primarily a forest watershed, 86% forest, 14% range. It was sampled in 2002 and eight sampling sites. And the Paradise Creek Watershed, which is in Lataw County, 11,000 hectares in size, 80% cropland, 20% forest land, sampled in 2007, and there were eight sampling sites within this watershed. Uh, we had a couple other watersheds. Uh, we had the Schwartz Watershed, 1,500 hectares. It's a, basically a, a forest watershed, 90% forest, 5% rangeland. It was sampled in 2010. We had four sampling sites in this watershed. We had the Silver Creek watershed, which is down in Blaine County, 26,000 hectares. It's a watershed that was mixed between cropland and rangeland, 45% rangeland, 55% cropland. It was sampled in 2005, and there were 10 specific sampling sites. And then finally, we had Tom Beale Creek watershed. It's only fourteen. It's only forty-eight hundred hectares. Uh, it's a much studied watershed. It was eighty percent cropland and about twenty percent rangeland. It was sampled in two thousand and nine, and there were six sampling sites. So here's our fifteen uh, watersheds. You can see we had cropland, we had rangeland, we had forest land. Uh, quite a range of land. If we wanted to take a look at the, a map of the state of Idaho, I know this is not the world's best map, uh, but this shows you where our sampling locations were, as far north as Boundary County. Uh, a lot of sampling sites in the panhandle of Idaho. We had Boulder Creek in Oahe County, and we had Silver Creek uh, here on the edge of Blaine County. So at each sampling site, we collected benthic samples. We used what's called a Hess sampler. You'll see a picture of it in a moment. And uh, we collected samples in the field. We took them back to the lab and we sorted. We identified the first 300 benthic insects we could find in the samples and we identified each of these species. Uh, we used a uh, commercially available software package that would uh, calculate 97 different metrics. Remember, we had lots of different species of benthic macroinvertebrates, and different species had different tolerances to different types of pollutants. 
And then we, from the software package, we got an SMI score and it was assigned per sample. And that would give us a water quality rating at the site in the field, anywhere from poor to very good. So here's a picture of a Hess sampler. Uh, basically, a Hess sampler is a steel tube, metal tube, and at the end of the tube, uh, we have uh, some cloth lining. We put that Hess sampler into a spot in the stream. And here's our sampler. This is a graduate student. This is D Justin Beck. Uh, this was done in the Myrtle Creek watershed in the far northern part of the state. What he does is he takes a brush and he scrapes the macroinvertebrates off the rocks within his sampler. And the water moving through the Hess sampler flushes the macroinvertebrates into this cloth sampling device. At the end of the cloth sampling device, uh, you basically have a, uh, a tube which you collect these macroinvertebrates, put them in a, a mason jar with some uh, alcohol solution in there to kill the uh, insects, and then you can label them and take them back to the lab. Um, there's a lot of work involved here. Here's our sampler, Justin, again, uh, his sampling site. I happen to be in the middle of this creek. And here he is in the middle of the creek, and he's scrubbing the rocks inside the Hess sampler to loosen the macroinvertebrates and to get them uh, to go into the uh, cloth collection apparatus. Um, quite a piece of work. Uh, it works very well, and it's something you just continuously do. At each sampling site, you know, we had 120 some odd sampling sites. At each sampling site, you did this three times. So we collected our macroinvertebrates. They went back to the lab to be identified and to come up with an SMI index that would rate the quality of water in that stream spot anywhere from poor to very good. Then what we wanted to do is we wanted to relate the values that we got, the stream index values. We wanted to relate it to other things we saw on the ground. We wanted to relate it to erosion rates on the land that was adjacent to the sampling sites. Uh, we did this by visual observations. Uh, we made these observations in 2008, 2009, 2013, and again in 2015. So even though the benthic macroinvertebrates uh, were really only evaluated once, uh, the erosion, the visual erosion rates were evaluated four times at each site. And we came up with erosion rate categories that we evaluated visually uh, by using a guide. And our erosion rate categories were less than 2, 2 to 5, 5 to 15, 15 to 25, and more than 25 metric tons per hectare per year. The erosion rate on the land that was adjacent and slightly upstream to our sampling sites in every stream. I would say that uh, erosion rates of less than 2 metric tons per hectare is certainly sustainable. Erosion rates of greater than 25 metric tons per hectare is, is, is really disastrous for the long-term health of the watershed. Stream water quality was also visually evaluated at each site. After we took our, our benthic macroinvertebrate samples, we had a visually developed system based on looking at the water, looking at the cobbles in the bottom of the stream, and looking at the sand in the bottom of the stream. The higher the percent cobbles, the better the water quality. The higher the percent sand, the poorer the water quality. And we also looked at uh, visual. We, want, we looked at turbidity of the water. And we came up with a water quality index. So we tried to relate the benthic macroinvertebrate value we got by sampling two erosion rates on land and two visual uh, diagnosis of water quality in the stream. Now remember, the, uh, 
the visual evaluations of water quality in the stream and the erosion rates are something that's not very repeated, re replicable. Uh, that's something that uh, each of us would have a bias toward. We could do it once, but we always we not we may not be able to come up with the same score when we came back and did it again. So the data that we collected, we wanted to relate our visual erosion rates to the SMI index that we got from our benthic macroinvertebrates. We wanted to relate the dominant land use in the watershed to the SMI index. We wanted to relate visual water quality to the SMI index. And we used statistics wherever we could where they were appropriate. So based on sampling macroinvertebrates, we were able to come up with SMI scores based on the species composition at each sampling site. Now, basically these SMI scores we came up with were based on the samples that we collected, the identification of the samples, and the relationship of the sample composition to what is considered an ideal pristine sample. So we have a pristine sample, a theoretical pristine sample saying what, what the benthic macroinvertebrate distribution should be in a pristine area that has not been impacted by humans. So 5% um, of our samples rated as very good water quality. We're, our sampling sites were very good water quality. 24% of our sampling sites, uh, we, we got good water quality scores. 39% of our sampling sites, we got only fair water quality scores. 26% of our sampling sites received poor uh, water quality scores. And 6% of our sampling sites got very poor scores. Based on other studies and observations in Idaho, the uh, benthic macroinvertebrate index range that we got was very typical. Uh, there was an excellent range from very good to poor in the 15 studied watersheds. In general, the undisturbed sites where human activity was minimal had good or better SMI scores, while the agricultural sites had SMI scores that ranged only from fair to poor. Now, if we take a look at our visual studies, if we look at visual soil erosion rates, um, here's our erosion rates again, uh, less than 2, 2 to 5, 5 to 15, 15 to 25, and more than 25 metric tons per hectare loss per year. This is how, how our sites stacked up. 9% of our sites at virtually no erosion, less than two uh, metric tons per hectare. Uh, when we got to five to 15 metric tons of erosion per hectare, 45% of our sites, 15 to 25% of our sites, 14% uh, uh, of our sites had 15 to 25 metric tons per hectare erosion rates, and 12% of our sites had really excessive erosion rates of 25 metric tons per hectare per year. Well, we found something very interesting, that the SMI scores were very much related to what we thought we saw visually. If we look at the relationship between visual erosion rates that we scored and the SMI scores, we got a very good relationship. Uh, where we saw the visual erosion rates on the land adjacent to our sampling sites was less than two uh, metric tons per hectare per year we had very good SMI scores. Where the erosion rates were very high, more than 25 metric tons per hectare, uh, our SMI scores were very poor. So this tells us a couple things. Um, the SMI scores, by looking at benthic macroinvertebrates, related very well to erosion rates. There was a close relationship there. Now remember, the erosion rate scores were visual estimates. Something that's not easily repeatable and something that would be would vary from person to person. 
conversely, the SMI scores uh, were very good values because all you had to do was follow a standard procedure and you would take a good score and you could identify the organisms. So the SMI scores are something that's very, re re very repeatable and something that's very relatable to actual on the ground conditions out in the environment. So if we look at the soil erosion impacts, uh, our visual erosion impacts were adjacent to our sampling sites and upstream three tenths of a kilometer from the sampling sites. We found an excellent relationship between observed soil erosion rates and the, the macroinvertebrate water quality rating. Where erosion rates were less than 15 metric tons per hectare per year, our scores were always good or better. So erosion had a big impact on water quality. When erosion rates exceeded 5 metric tons per hectare per year, our SMI scores were less than good 86% of the time. Statistical number. When soil erosion rates were less than 5 metric tons per hectare per year, our SMI scores were good or very good. Again, a statistical number. Statistically significant. And when soil erosion rates were between 5 and 15 metric tons per hectare per year, our benthic macro and vertebrate index scores were most frequently fair. So there was a, a very, very good relationship here. Again, when soil erosion rates were between 15 and 25 metric tons per hectare per year, our SMI scores were most frequently poor. And when soil erosion rates exceeded 25 metric tons per hectare per year, our scores were usually very poor. So a very significant relationship. We also visually evaluated water quality, and this is, this is how we did it. Water quality was visually related at the 124 sampling sites in both 2013 and 2015. We used a scale of 1 to 7, 1 being water quality excellent, visually related, 7 water quality re, re, uh, rated very poor. Our scale accounted for clarity, how clear the water was, and the substrate composition on the bottom of the stream. Now remember, substrate composition is related to fish spawning and habitat for fish. We want cobbles on the bottom of the stream. We don't want sand. Cobbles prov provides good habitat. So we came up with a scale, our visual um, water quality rating scale. Uh, so we got the best water quality visual rating scale when we had clear water and there were cobbles on the bottom of the stream. As the percentage of cobbles decreased, the visual water quality score changed. Two, which is not as good as a score of one, 50% cobbles, 50% sand. Uh, when the bottom was covered with 80% or more sand, we had a score of three. Uh, turbid water. We could see the bottom of the creek, and there were cobbles on the bottom, but the water was turbid. Score of five, if we had turbid water, not clear water, we could see the bottom, but it was a mixture of 50% cobbles, 50% sand. Uh, six, the water again was turbid, we could see the bottom, but it was over 80% sand, not the best habitat for fish. And they got a visual water quality rating score of seven if the water was too turbid to see the bottom of the stream. Now remember, these are not deep streams. So if we look at our watersheds, and we look at our visual water quality rating, uh, we see a really good relationship between the benthic macroinvertebrate scores and our visual water quality rating. Remember uh, here, uh, here's our water, our watersheds. I'm ranking the first, the the best four watersheds and the three worst watersheds. Uh, the average score. Remember, the lower the score, the better visually the water quality was. What the range, let's say at Fish Creek, we had eight samples. Uh, 
the average was 1.4. That means the scores range between 1 and 3 at each site. And then what was this, the uh, benthic macroinvertebrate index? Well, our best creek was, uh, our best watershed was Fish Creek. And Fish Creek is in the uh, Clearwater National Forest. Uh, the water was very clear there. And our benthic macroinvertebrate index, uh, based on our sampling, was also very good. Myrtle Creek, a forested watershed in Boundary County, a very good score, 1.8. Uh, our benthic macroinvertebrate score, based on our sampling, was good. Silver Creek, down in Blaine County, a uh, fairly pristine area, good SMI score. Schwartz Creek, also a good score. Then we go to our worst creeks. Uh, Lake Creek, uh, up in Kootenai County, Kootenai Benoit County, um, water quality score pretty low, 5.5, 5.4, and our uh, benthic macroinvertebrate index was only fair. We go to Paradise Creek in Lataw County, poor. We go to Clear Creek. Again, a fair value. So I just showed you the best four and the worst three. So there was a very good relationship between what we thought the water quality was from a visual standpoint, looking at clarity and cobbles, and what the uh, macroinvertebrate test showed us. Uh, we have to take a look at the impact of time also. Um, the impact of time of sampling on SMI values, the impact of time of sampling on soil erosion estimates, and the impact of time of sampling uh, on visual estimates of water quality. So there were some impacts. If we look at these impacts in comparison, if we look at uh, benthic macro values, uh, we didn't see any difference when we compared our samples we took in 2001 versus 2017. Didn't see any differences between the values we took in 2013 versus 2015. But there was a difference if we compared the samples we took in 2001 to 2015. That's a 14-year period. So we did see change over a 14-year period, this 14-year period. We look at visual water quality. We didn't really see any differences between our two sampling years, 2013 and 2015. So if we look at the relationship of sampling date versus soil erosion numbers, again, soil erosion was visually done. If we look at the comparison between 2008, 2009, no difference. Uh, 2013 and 2015, no difference. But if we look at longer periods of time, comparison 2008 versus 2013 and 2008 versus 2015, we did get significant differences. So time uh, as you would suspect, would change. Uh, the erosion rates uh, would change with time because uh, where you had soils that were disturbed, vegetation was coming in. If we take a look at the impact of land use, the dominant land use adjacent to, and unsurprisingly, um, we got a table that looked like this. If we look at a forest system, where no trees had been harvested in the previous eight to 10 years. Uh, we had good SMI indexes. The benthic macros were in really good shape in the stream. Forestry, um, where we had high harvesting within the past eight years, uh, the soil, uh, the benthic macroinvertebrate index was only fair. We look at range, uh, SMI scores were good, and agriculture poor. And we uh, look at differences in years. But I think what was really important is where we had continuously covered land adjacent to our streams, forestry with no harvesting, we had really good benthic macroinvertebrate values. Where we had the maximum disturbance, which would be in agricultural systems, we had very poor values. 
So what we found is that benthic macroinvertebrate numbers and this technique can replace all these visual estimates that are very difficult to repeat. Strong significant relationships were observed between water quality ratings and observed soil erosion rates. So our benthic macroinvertebrate scores predicted the water quality and erosion rates. Sites with soil erosion rates of less than two metric tons per hectare per year generally had water quality ratings of very good. Conversely, when soil erosion rates on adjacent landscapes exceeded five metric tons per hectare per year, uh, the SMI water quality scores were fair or worse than fair. They were fair or poor. A strong relationship between land use management and adjacent water quality in the 15 studied Idaho watersheds was observed. Watersheds with minimal land disturbance in the last 25 years had visual water quality ratings superior to the watersheds with moderate to significant disturbances. And finally, in general, the land use practices of forestry, range, and agriculture adjacent to streams resulted in SMI water quality ratings of good, good, and poor, respectively. So forestry related uh, resulted in good, range good, and agriculture poor. The worst water quality in the 15 studied watershed is linked to intensive agricultural cropping systems. So this kind of gives you the value of using benthic macroinvertebrates. Very repeatable. Uh, it's an exacting science. All you have to do is uh, sample the streams correctly, take those samples into the laboratory, identify uh, the insects, put them into a, met a matrix, and it will spit out an SMI score for you. That's far better than having to go out and visually evaluating erosion rates and visually evaluating water quality within the stream uh, by using guides because they're not repeatable person to person and year to year. Thank you. I just wanted to show you the value of benthic macroinvertebrates. They're widely used in the United States and they're becoming more and more widely used in many areas of the world. Thank you. To three kilometers upstream from our sampling site. We recorded that. Four dominant land uses were uh, forestry with no harvesting, forestry with harvesting sometime in the last eight years, range and agriculture. Relationships among the dominant land use and um, benthic macroinvertebrate index uh, were, evaluated, were evaluated. And uh, not because benthic macroinvertebrates do not migrate up and down the stream. They're sedentary. A benthic macroinvertebrate index indicates short-term environmental impacts due to the fact that they have short life cycles. And a benthic macroinvertebrate index allows biologists to rapidly and easily examine water quality. Let's say we have an unknown stream that we want to determine what the water quality is. We can send a team of biologists in there, collect samples, bring these samples back to the lab, sort the samples, count the samples, and we can get a relatively good value of the quality of that stream in a relatively short period of time. 